We've been in a series on foundations a few weeks ago or a couple months ago now, I guess. Uh, I just felt like the Lord really began to speak to me about talking through some of the foundational messages, some of the core messages of this house as we come on our 10-year anniversary this year. And so uh, we haven't even got that far, to be honest with you, because I've been stuck on this one issue of God's a good father. We talked about uh, just the foundation of holiness, the foundation of generations. But a few weeks ago, um, opened up this concept that God is a good father. And how you view God affects every single area of your life. Every area of your life is, is affected by one of two things, by how you view one of two things, how you view God and how you view God seeing you. So how I see God or what I perceive how God sees me, every area of your life is affected by one of those two things. And so what we talked about was the enemy from the beginning, the devil in the garden was trying to distort who God was, so that we would have a wrong view of God, so that we would not trust God, so that we would not move towards God, but rather we would distrust him and move away from him. And uh, we talked about this concept, that, that how you view something matters greatly. Because how you view something determines then how you're going to interact with it. This is what Romans chapter 1, verse 25, it says this, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And so, so what happens in our life is sometimes it's big, blatant, sometimes it's subtle, but we exchange the truth about who God really is and we exchange it and allow a lie to come in. And it distorts our view of God. And the reason why this matters is, is because how I see something determines how I interact with it, how I engage with it. So if I see something improperly, I'm going to engage with it improperly. God calls us to, to come to him. God, God wants to comfort us. He wants to be our provider. He wants to walk with us. He wants to protect. He wants you to know him as a good father. But when I have a distorted view of God, when I've, allowed, when I've exchanged the truth about God as a good father and I've exchanged it for a lie, no matter how subtle it may be, all of a sudden, there are real consequences to that. All of a sudden, when I'm in pain, I don't run to the comforter, God. I don't run to God for comfort. I move away from him. I've blamed him. He's the reason for my pain. I have a distorted view of God and, 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 and what he's doing in my life. And so I don't move towards him. I move away from him. The very person who can bring healing in my life, the very person who can bring comfort in my life, I don't go to because I have a distorted view of him. I don't see him as a good and perfect father. When you see God as somebody who's just angry with you, somebody who's disappointed with you, somebody who just wants to punish you, we don't, he, that, that, that God, somebody who is cold, somebody who is distant, somebody who isn't caring, when that's how I view God, even subtly, I don't move towards him. He's not my first option. I'll tell you right now, God wants to be your first option. God wants to be your first option. I don't know if you've ever seen little kids. Uh, it doesn't matter what happens in their life when they've got a good connection with a parent, with their mom. It doesn't matter what's happening in their life. They, their default mode is, I want to go to mom. I fell down and skinned my knee, mom. I got a good grade on the test, Mom. <laughs> Something happened in my life that I want to celebrate, mom. Something happened in my life that caused me pain, mom, right? right? You, get, you get that? Like, there's just an immediate, like, I want to go tell mom. I want to go, I want to, go to mom or dad. You get my point. I want to go to mom for comfort. I want, to go mom, I want to go to mom to celebrate. I want to go to mom for wisdom. It's just that little kids have that thing in them that's just like, I'm going to a parent. God wants that. God wants it. Like, when you're in pain, come to me. When you're celebrating, come to me. We need wisdom, come to me. But when we get a wrong view of God, we'll come to him, but it's kind of a last resort when it feels like we have no other option. When we are desperate enough to realize there's not another option, I guess I'll go to God. And this happens in the church. I'm not talking to people that don't know Jesus right now. I'm talking about to those who know Jesus. The lie that you believe is not, is there a God? You're not exchanging the truth about God exists with the lie that God doesn't exist. You're exchanging the truth about God being a good and perfect father 
with subtle lies that maybe he's not. Maybe he can't be trusted. Maybe he's not a healer. Maybe he's not true to his promises. Maybe he's not a provider. Maybe he's not a protector. He's there. He's real. He's the Savior. I'll go to him if I have no other option. Or there's all the layers in between that. Are you with me on this? And so what I believe God is wanting to do in our midst right now as a church community is he's wanting to begin to shine light on lies that are actually distorting God, you seeing God as a good and perfect father. Because they affect every area of your life. I would tell you this. I, I, I want to say this. I, any problem in your life right now, any area where you are in bondage or where you can't get break, I'm telling you right now, it is connected to either how you view God or how you believe God views you. And so, so the goal here is just to kind of unpack some of that stuff. I mentioned this before, and then we're going to have a conversation with some friends. But the question is, is how do lies find their way into my life to distort the truth that God is a good and perfect father? How does that happen? And again, for most of us, they're subtle and we don't even realize it's going on. We don't even realize we're approaching God like this. And I mentioned three of them. I talked about two of them and today we're going to talk about the third one. But the first, the first way that lies kind of get in is just imperfect parents. And what we talked about with that was just, we have such a hard time. We have such a hard time disconnecting our experience with, in particular, parents to who God is. It's, it's amazing. We, we, you know, maybe you, had, maybe you had a dad, and even if you had award-winning parents, <laughs> even if you had parents who got awards because they were so amazing at parenting. They're still imperfect. They still don't fully reflect who God is. And some of you guys, you didn't have award-winning parents. They were the opposite of that. Cops were showing up to your house. Not to give them a, 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 an award, right? This is, this is the, the type of stuff that happened in your house. No matter, what, no matter what spectrum your parents were on, it's so hard for us sometimes that, man... My dad was critical of me. It just seemed like I could never really please him. Well, that must be how God is too. And we're not processing this, but this is what we believe. Well, God's probably critical. He's probably never happy with me. He's probably disappointed. You know, my mom, she wasn't really there for me emotionally. Well, God's probably not there for me emotionally either. And so what happens is, is we have such a hard time, we have, we have an experience with a human being and then want to kind of superimpose that onto who God is. And God just says, I'm unlike any person you've ever met. But the enemy comes in and he, the, the accuser comes in to accuse God and say, God's critical too. You know, you tripped up last night. God's so frustrated with you about that. He's so frustrated with you. When I believe that, you think I'm going to God? You think I'm running to God? God, I tripped up, I tripped up last night. You think I'm running to God? When the enemy's in there going like, oh, he's disappointed in you. He's disappointed. Second reason is, the second thing is this, and I don't, it's just, we live in a culture that just full-blown is teaching a lie about God everywhere you turn. There is something called the Antichrist spirit that is actually anti-God. It is opposed to God. And so everywhere in culture, it is lying to you about what true love is, about what true freedom is. That love, that love is just no constraints, no boundaries, uh, no requirements on you. That true freedom is just all constraints gone. And then God shows up and goes, hey, I've got some requirements. I've got some constraints. I've got some boundaries for you. Now, he's doing it for our good. He's doing it because he has our best interests in mind. The world's trying to convince you that that's not the case. So all of a sudden we begin to, or, they, or we blame God. Even acts of God. We use phrases like acts of God. You know, that earthquake, that was an act of God. 
this, this is what happens, right? We're just, we're just going like that. That was an act of God, that earthquake that just killed all those people. We just kind of, we, we would, right? So we're just in a world that's doing that. But here's the third one, and this is, the, this is, this is why we're going to spin. This is the biggest one. Is that so many times lies come in to distort our view of God as a good and perfect father when we are trying to make sense of pain and loss in this world. We have all experienced pain. We've all experienced loss. We've all experienced things not working at many differing degrees. There are worst case nightmare scenarios of losing children. There are times of uh, uh, horrible things that have happened to kid, but also businesses that have closed down and a house that you didn't get and work being this. There's just all these layers, but in the midst of pain and loss in this world, as we're trying to make sense of it, the accuser kind of comes right alongside and begins to feed lies about, is God really good? So what I want to do today, we're not going to solve this problem today, but here's what I want to do, is I want to have a conversation with Michael Rodor and, uh, Michael Rodor and Sherry Silk. They can come up right now. And I want to take a few minutes with you guys and maybe just talk a little bit about this thing about how do we actually navigate uh, times where pain and loss are there? How do we protect our hearts to not allow lies to get in? And how do we go back and deal with the lies that are there uh, that have accused God and said he's not a good father, he's not good, he's not perfect? And uh, so we're going to do that today. We're going to take a few minutes. Is that all right? I didn't even... Will you guys welcome uh, Michael and Sherry as they come up? real quick. Uh, Michael Brodeur has been on staff with us uh, for a couple years now, um, uh, was a pastor for over 30 years in San Francisco, and then uh, was up at Bethel for about 12 years recently, and then just came on staff with us, is an associate pastor here, as well as just a theologian in residence for us. That's what we call him right there. Um, which just means he's smarter and more educated than us. That's, that's, uh, that's how it works right there. And then Sherry Silk is the executive director of the movement side of Jesus Culture. And uh, also her and her husband, Danny, pastored a church in Weaverville, California for uh, five years. And then um, was on staff at Bethel for how long? 15. 15 years right there. We were just talking about anybody from Weaverville? Weaverville's like a little small mountain community, about 3,000 people, about an hour outside of Reading. And when we first started getting to know them, they were just super small town people. So I remember legitimately asking them one time, I said, well, I was getting their phone number. I said, what's your phone number? And the guy's like, 4162. I was like, you just gave me four numbers. Like, how is that your phone number? How does it work? But it's just such a small community that everybody has the same area code and the, and the, and the first three. <laughs> so they literally would just, they didn't even think about it, 4162. So I'm like, oh, all right, well. Uh. So that's where she's from. She's small town Sherry. Uh, thanks. I think, yeah, we're not sure. We're not sure. Listen, so we're going to jump in. Uh, my goal, uh, we, we've had this conversation with you guys. My goal is to just kind of really help people. One, just go, oh, wow, I think I've allowed a lie get in while I was trying to make sense of pain and loss. I think I let a lie get 30 years ago or three minutes ago. I think this, uh, a lie kind of got in, and it's, and it's caused me to lean back away from God, rather than experience the fullness of what God wants for me, rather than experiencing God as a good and perfect father, I'm experiencing him a different way. And so we want to talk through this. Michael, first of all, you could just talk biblically for a second and uh, just kind of maybe lay a little bit of a biblical framework before we jump into some of the practical pastoral sides of these things. Uh, this is the question, obviously, that people have wrestled for thousands of years, and I'm going to ask you right now. You're going to solve it right now in full sum of St. Patrick's Day. We're going to solve this issue right here. And it's really around this thing that people do. We are a people that would boldly, unapologetically, unashamedly make this declaration from Scripture. God is good. God is kind. God is a provider, a protector, and his promises are true. And God is sovereign in the earth. He's in charge. We would say all those statements, and then people would say, help me understand this then. If God is good, 
why does he allow bad things to happen to good people? Or even on a bigger scope, if God is sovereign, then why does he allow things like the Holocaust to happen? That's, or, or you could just put a bunch of other things into that thing, you know. Uh, famine and Holocaust and child sex trafficking and all the just like if God is sovereign, if he's good, why do bad things happen to people and why do bad things happen at a bigger scale as well? So if you could just unpack that in 30 seconds, would really just, yes, really just appreciate that. Yeah. Well, again, you guys got to understand that the greater minds than ours have struggled with this question for yeah. millennia. And so but what I want to do is zero in on one specific truth in the many layers of truth that answer this question. And the best place to always begin is the book of Genesis. Genesis 1 is very clear that God is good and he is the creator. He made all things to be good. And he got down to Adam and Eve and he said, he said this is good as well. And then he gave them an assignment to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion. In other words, God himself delegated the leadership of this planet to humanity. Amen. Of course, you know the story. We sinned, and in so doing, that released a curse upon the earth that is accountable for all the pain, all the garbage, all the... Um, the earthquakes and the traumas, the climate issues, the hurricanes and the tornadoes, as well as the cancers and the other kinds of physical problems. In other words, prior to that time, there was not a curse on the earth. Okay, so the real answer to that question is, why does God allow these things? God did not allow them. We allowed them through our sinful disobedience and rejection of God's will. We, as the delegated authority of the earth did this. Okay, but God had a redemptive plan. And this is the issue we need to understand is that God was not wringing his hands. God set in motion an incredible plan to restore humanity and to restore the earth to his intended purpose. And that's really what we're part of right now. Jesus came, he died, he broke the power of sin and hell. And now you and I are part of a new creation to restore his perfect will as much as possible before he returns and does it all. In Jesus' name. Yeah. And a, a follow-up with that, B, because a lot of people, and, and, and maybe not everybody's in this category, but this is kind of like something happens and we begin just to believe that God's a vindictive, angry, grumpy guy up there who's all-powerful and is, just, you know, which, which, is, which couldn't be further from the truth, but... But how do we kind of, how do we, how do we position our hearts? And I'm going to talk in the bigger scale of things, to not blame God. Uh, Maybe just a little bit of follow-up. Sure. How, do, how do I make sure that I don't fall into that trap where I begin to blame God as some vindictive guy up there who's just angry? Maybe we don't say it quite that blatantly as believers, how do I position my heart not to blame God for the bad things? Well, first of all, we need to remember John 3.16, that God so loved that he gave. Okay, that's the foundation. The second one is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and not imputing their trespasses against them, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So it's necessary for us to establish a firm foundation of the love of God, and that gives us the basis by which we can begin to say no to the internal accusations against the nature and character of God and also say no to the demonic darts that are flying at us to actually take pain and, and loss and disappointment and attribute it to God as if God is a vindictive, angry God. No, there's brokenness in this world. There's problems in this world. But ultimately, God is on the side of restoration. He's on the side of healing. He's on the side of uh, the fulfillment of his perfect will, which is viewed in Eden. It's viewed in Jesus. And it's viewed in heaven. That ultimately, we know that God wins. We're going to get to, I think it, what's helpful as well is we're going to get to the unanswered question piece of this conversation, but I remember Bill, uh, Bill Johnson talking about 
you know, John 10, 10, you know, Jesus came to give life and life more abundantly. The thief came to steal, kill, and destroy. The forensic side of recognizing whose fingerprints are on that. And I think it's important to understand as we look at some of the calamity around the world, as we look at some of the, the stuff that's just so heartbreaking, that we would be able to recognize, oh, the fingerprints that are on that, steal, kill, and destroy, is not God. It's, it's, that, that's not God's fingerprints on those things and that we would be able to have that foundation. Mike, let me ask this question and then we'll uh, just, again, just some of the biblical foundation and we'll get into the practical. How important is it to, uh, to have an understanding of eternity as we look at this stuff? We are very uh, kind of temporal. We're, we're very like what we see is here it's very hard for us to under, we, we've got, whether it's 70 years or 90 years, whatever else is, we've got this life here. We, we kind of tend to look at all of this just in this snapshot where the Bible actually goes, oh, no, no, this snapshot is just a moment. It's a breath, it's a vapor, it, it, it's grass that grows. There's an eternity that is ahead of us. How, how important is it as we say, we all have, and, and this is real, there's real pain, real loss. Yes. How do we navigate pain and loss and not allow it, not allow the accuser to lie to us without having a scope about eternity as part of our foundation? Well, I mean, one of the reasons I read the Bible through every single year is to get the big picture of God's purposes on the earth. And what you have to realize is that God made all things good. They got corrupted through sin and a curse came on the earth. But ultimately, in God's redemptive plan, he has chosen to bring all those who know him and have had their sins forgiven into a place called heaven. Okay, that ultimately we are going to be with Jesus is forever and ever and ever. And the Bible says that God will wipe away every tear from our eyes, that we will be completely healed, we will be completely in love with each other, we will be connected, there will be, you know, forgiveness will be automatic. All the things we long for on this earth will be fulfilled when we go to be with him. But for this season, we are stuck in what is called sort of the already, Jesus died, Jesus broke the power of sin and hell and the devil, and the not yet. We're not in heaven yet. So we're still walking out the restoration of a broken world by the power and the authority of Jesus. He is in us to rectify. The scripture says so clearly that we are given as ministers of reconciliation, bringing the world back into harmony, back into alliance with the God who made us. Yeah, so good. So good, Michael. Sherry, let me ask this real quick, just practically. Um, obviously, we've known each other for a long time. Both of you are up here. Um, just, you know. Because we're old. Yeah. Well, you're experienced. <laughs> know, yeah. You're experienced. Um, uh, you've walked through a lot in life. Uh, uh, you've walked through loss. You've walked through pain. You've walked through confusing times. Kept yourself anchored in the goodness of God. Kept yourself anchored with intimacy with the Lord. And you see him as a good father. How have you in what you've walked out, kept your heart guarded to, from lies and connected to God, even in the midst of real pain and confusion? Yeah, yeah we, I mean, lots of childhood trauma, um, I think, sort of gives me the opportunity. I, I could choose to be an orphan <laughs> or be adopted by Christ, I think, and, and living my life out of those two scenarios. Those are two options that are real for every one of us every single day. I can, I think it was Russell Evans that said, I can either uh, live out of the circumstances of my life or the uh, position I have in Christ. Yeah. And so those are choices. And the most, you know, my, my mother passed away when I was 38 years old from cancer um, and then just three years ago, lost a dear, dear friend to cancer. And two years ago, was diagnosed myself with cancer. And so I could be ticked off about all of that, you know. And, and honestly, I've learned in my life that anger really is just fake power. Yeah. It makes us feel powerful. It, it actually has a destructive nature. And I'm not talking about not setting boundaries, but anger, just rage, is just fake power. So, so when, like, I remember when my mom passed away, 
um, I'm not warring with God. I'm warring with my feelings, with my emotions. And they are real and raw and hard. And she passed away right after Christmas, and we had this um, prayer meeting on New Year's Eve, all night prayer, and I wanted to just stay home. And I would have had a good excuse to do so. But I just had to, as fast as I can, get back to the, my identity in Christ. And I had, to, I had to fight through it. So I got up there. I danced. I had flags back then. People, come on. And I, the, the things that we were singing today, you know, all thrones and dominion, all power and positions, we have to fight our way to that point of having the authority in Christ. I, I saw this quote as I was getting ready uh, f- for today. It said, our greatest need is to become who we already are. We already are in Christ, and with that comes lots of authority. And so taking that position, um, because the alternative is bad. <laughs> yeah. Talk about that real quick, the alternative, because sometimes what I find pastorally walking with people, they're, they're encountering pain, loss, confusion. They're in that thing. Again, it's a variety of things. We've sat sure. with parents that have lost children. Yes. We've sat with people who've lost businesses, uh, divorces, uh, but, but also a variety of things that just are, are, are tough in life. And um, in that moment, and we're going to talk a little bit about how to process pain and things like that, but in that moment, I see them begin to kind of choose what you're talking about, more like, I'm just going to control it. I'm not going to go towards God. I'm not going to trust him. The pragmatic side of me <laughs> just wants to go, oh, that road, that's a painful road. Yeah. Like, that, that's, a, that's a painful road. That There are two options. I either trust God mm-hmm. or I take control of my life. Mm-hmm. And that road is painful. How do you kind of, um, do you kind of internally get a little bit that practical and pragmatic? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can sit up here and tell you all my victories, but I can also say that there's really low, low moments when you're dealing with loss and pain and, and, and having to do something with them. You know, I've had, I remember um, early on in our marriage, we had a friend uh, get in an accident, and I remember not wanting to be on the prayer line and pray for people because my faith was wavering. That's real. Um, but I know the truth. And so getting back to the truth. That, and I, I think one of the things that helps me is I can't stay the victim of my life. Yes. Because if I'm a victim, I will be responsible for nothing. No, no. I'm not responsible at all. Now, I know that I've been victimized. People are victimized. Things happen there that are terrible things that they have to overcome. So I'm not saying don't, you're never going to be a victim. I'm saying don't stay there, don't live there, get out of there as fast as you can. Do everything you can to get, up, get back onto the top of, of you having authority in Christ. And my identity is he says that um, I, he's in my heart from, out of faith. Mm-hmm. And from that, I know the, the depths of his love. From having him in my heart by faith, sometimes just by faith. And then I get to know the, the love of God from that spot. The Bible talks about seeing uh, that we see dimly, just in part right now. Uh, it's, we, we don't see fully. And uh, I find as I walk with people that have experienced pain and loss, myself as well, that uh, part of the hard part is, is wanting answers, is somehow trying to make sense of this trying to figure out why I believe God is good uh, when my experience doesn't seem to line up to what the truth of is uh, who God is. He's loving, he's kind, he's compassionate, he protects me, he provides for me, and yet there are real stories. My wife could tell you real stories of as a kid uh, uh, about being abused and losing people. And I find that there's this, this thing where we're so desperate for answers, we just start making up some things that aren't helpful either. I, I talked about this. CJ, when she was nine, lost her brother who was 18 years old in a uh, car accident. And, you know, well-intentioned, well-meaning people are telling the nine-year-old uh, because at his funeral, seven people got saved. And they said, well, the Lord took him because he wanted seven people to get saved. And so, you know, it's, again, well-intentioned, trying to somehow make sense or have an answer for something that we just don't have an answer for. 
you know, or, or it's just kind of a cold, calculated, well, there's just sin in the world and real choices, you know. So, so my question is, is, what do we do when we don't have answers? Because <laughs> there aren't really answers, at least in this life. Wow. Well, you know, just a little bit of my story. You know, my wife and I, we were both raised in non-Christian homes, a lot of abuse, a lot of neglect. We finally found, or Jesus found us, Jesus rescued us. And here we are years later planting a church in San Francisco and everything is going swimmingly well. I mean, our, there's, you know, signs and wonders, deliverance and healings. There was you know, people coming to Christ, church was growing, it was amazing, and then we discovered that two of our kids had been injured horribly, and uh, it was just so devastating to us. In fact, our first counselor had been said, harmed, had been harmed, they had by, been harmed yeah, yeah, by, by people, a neighbor, yeah. and yeah. and uh, <laughs> the first counselor we went to said, oh, well, you know, 90% of all marriages will fail because of a trauma of this kind. Thank you very much, you know. Anyway, so we were devastated. And then a few, a few months later, my dad dies. And my dad was an abuser. And, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm thrown into this incredible, like, uh, tailspin emotionally. And, and I really went to God. I was just, God, I can't understand this. What's going on? Please help me. I, you know, I was desperate for an answer. And uh, the Lord spoke something to me that was very interesting. It sounds a little bit hallmark Cardish right now, but it said, he said, you don't need to know why. It's enough for you to know the one who knows why. And I thought, whoa, you know, this is so devastating. And the next question was, are you willing to surrender your right to understand? Are you willing to just throw it all on the, on the table and trust me that I know what's up, even if you don't know what's up? Because I believe our demand, our entitlement, our sense of our need to know why is the last vestige of control. I want to control my reality, and sometimes having that information gives me that sense of power. But really what Jesus is after, not that he caused the crisis, but that he's willing to actually utilize the crisis to transform me into the nature and character of Jesus just a little bit more, and so I surrender. I want to encourage you guys to surrender the right to know why. How do you navigate unanswered? I think just, for me, I, I've learned so much around fear this last couple of years, and... Um, that fear is not my friend. Mm. And when I'm afraid, I am not myself. When I'm afraid, I'm not connected to my identity in Christ. When I'm afraid, I am flailing around. And I, I think I've, I don't have the answers. You know, we don't have the answers. But I, I know that I can s just loop and spin in my mess and my thoughts, but if I'm loopy and I can't get out of it, I need some help. And one of the things I, I learned about fear is, you know, the, the famous scripture, you know, that our enemy roams and prowls like a roaring lion. He's seeking who he can devour. I learned that he prowls and he roars. And instead of being afraid of those things and running, I will turn and face them because God gave him that roar. That lion's roar, that's, that's a natural nature thing. And instead of being afraid of it, I just lean in and I'm like, you have no authority yes, here. Yes. And I, I have to get in touch with what I call that 3 a.m. courage. You know, when you wake up at 3 a.m. and yeah. your mind's going, and my son and my daughter and my job, and my, it's like, what? Your thoughts are, get in touch with that, like who I am in Christ and what authority do I walk in right now. If you can't do it for yourself, then... Call a friend, wake someone up, do something, and get some input. But because I can't make sense of it, I, I, you know, when people found out I was sick, my inbox filled up on Facebook or whatever with all kinds of suggestions. Thank you if you're out there. Thank you very much um, for this remedy and that prayer and say this and take that and watch this and do this and that. And you're just like. It's a, it, when you're in situations like that, it's like a fog that's rolling in. Yeah. And so you're like, okay, blow that fog away. 
listen for Jesus to follow your peace and find where the direction you're supposed to take, you know, what treatment, what prayer, what whatever, um, and get through the fog and, and walk in your authority. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I, I think that we have to give ourselves permission to actually say, I don't know. So at some level, this happened. Why? I don't know. But here's what I do know. Yes. I know that God's yes. good. I know that God loves me. I know that God has my best in mind. I know that God is my promise, that, that his promises are true, that he's my provider, protector. I know that God brings beautiful things out of ashes. Yes. This is what I know. And people go, well, well how, how, can you, how can you reconcile that with what you've experienced? I don't know about that. Here's what I do know. And this is that kind of stance. Yes. I don't know. CJ would say, I don't know why my brother died. Here's what I do know. I do know that I know that he is good. I know that he is kind. I know that he's my protection. I don't know why that abuse happened. Here's what I do know. And that we, you really actually have permission to, to say, I don't know. I have no idea why that happened. But that's not going to undermine what I do know. And I'm not going to allow what I don't know to sabotage what I do know. And here's what I do know. Let me ask this as kind of the last question. Um, and we'll take a few minutes on this. Um, if you were to sit down with somebody in your office right now, pastorally working with them, and just say, how do we process pain and loss in a healthy way? And I, I don't want to just set it up with this. Our goal is, is, is that we see we do not allow a lie to get in during pain and loss and trauma. We don't allow a lie to get in that distorts our view of God as a good father. That we continue to see the truth. We don't exchange the truth of God for a lie that we continue to see him truthfully and therefore we continue to move towards him. We trust him. Intimacy is still there. We yeah. go to him. You, you know what I'm saying? That's the goal. That even in trauma and loss, right. I still see him properly and I, and I have guarded my heart and not allowed a lie to get in. What would your advice be if somebody's sitting in the office right now on how do you kind of process pain and loss in the midst of that? Wow. Well, the first thing I think is to go back to what Sherry was uh, quoting this, the scripture in 1 Peter 5, verses 8 through probably 10 or 12. That particular passage is so interesting because it says that the enemy, like a roaring lion, is seeking whom he devour. How does he devour? lies, destructive thoughts. And so we need to say no initially to the enemy. We need to forbid any kind of interaction on that level. Don't let him take the evidence of pain, of loss, and then take that evidence as the prosecuting attorney and hold God as the one who's responsible. Okay, because that's, that's what the word devil means. It means an accuser. And he no longer has authority to accuse us before God because the cross, he has been cast down. But here's the deal, is he does still have authority to accuse God to you. And so you need to stand firm. The second thing you need to do is you need to actually be careful not to allow yourself to fall into what I call Christian denial, which is, yeah, my brain knows that God is good, but my heart is all troubled with all kinds of confusion. No, we need to allow whatever's, you know, whatever truth we know to be the truth that displaces the lie. And then the final thing I'll say here. Can, can I? Yeah. Uh, don't forget your third thing. Yeah. Um, he's describing the Psalms. It, it, he's describing David who's wrestling with the Lord. How could you let this happen? How, what's going on here? Right. What is, like, like David really, now, he, now David always ends up at a place of truth. Yes. But he has no problem wrestling through what he's, what he's feeling, what he's doing, asking God, like, what's going on? Now, now he just doesn't stay there. And, he, and the, the healthy part is he gets to a place. But he's not in denial. It is that thing of, like, bless God, brother. Everything's fine. You know, you, you, know, you meet with people, you're like, dude, that was a massive loss. God is good. I'm like, yeah, I know he is. But, like, like, the honesty to be able to actually say, to be able to process that in the presence of God and go, no, I'm actually 
what are you doing? <laughs> like, why would you do that and just yeah. process that stuff out? No, God is not threatened by the reality of what you're really feeling in the midst of your loss and your pain. You can come to him. You can open up. The scripture says, all things are laid naked and bare before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. That we need to open up before him and allow him access to the deepest feelings of our heart and let him, as it says in First, uh, Second Corinthians, actually chapter 1, that God is the comforter who comforts us in all of our tribulation so that we can comfort others. In other words, this bare-hearted interaction with God in the midst of pain, in the midst of loss, in the midst of disappointment, Appointment, but then to come through like David did in the Psalms and be able to say, but I know my Redeemer lives. I know that he is good and that his goodness will actually prevail over every single pain in my life. Amen. Amen. We didn't get to your third point, but I'm sure it's good. That was the third point. Yeah, no, Sherry, real quick. Um, you talk about the need to actually bring people in that this isn't just a, uh, it's not always just you and Jesus working this out. Like, yes. like, like in, real, in real loss, in real there, there is a communal aspect of kind of working through this. Can you just briefly touch on that? And we can have the worship team start making uh, their way up. The, um, I think that one of the, the schemes of the devil is to get you isolated and by, by yourself and then therefore that orphan thing. When you're an orphan, you know, you, it's up to you to protect yourself. And, but God protects us from everything. So if we find ourselves just really isolated and lonely, uh, that's, we might even be in sin. I mean, we may just be dealing with our stuff, but we could go as far as, you know, sometimes when there's a child and they ask a lot of questions and why, mommy, why, why, why? But when they stomp their foot and say, why? They're not really curious. They just don't like the answer. And so are we stomping our foot when we're asking God why? Are we just showing up our feelings? You know, you, I think he loves to hear from us just like we love to hear from our children and not being afraid to, to, to just go ahead and feel all those feelings, but figure out another way. You, you know, we need counselors. We need therapists. We need friends. We, sometimes we need someone that will smack us upside the head. You know, whatever you need, invite it in. Because I don't want to sit here in my pain. I don't want to waste another second giving the enemy uh, say over my life. I don't want to waste days. I don't want to waste moments. I don't want to waste years by being angry and upset about something the devil did. And, and I want to live in a place of peace and love. When we were getting ready for this, I had this uh, sense. I just feel like people get tired of the fight. And I feel like there's people even here today, that when you're in that space all the time fighting with your emotions, we, we need to come to a place of surrender, like, I can do nothing more. And maybe it's a daily surrender, but I think there's people here that are tired. They're tired of that fight and that disappointment. And, and I just want God to refresh you today. We're going to pray. Benny will lead us, but I just, I want you to give it to God, the pain, the the disappointment, the hurt, yeah. and let him meet you there.